Hello everyone, I'm Elisaveta Palaznik. Uh, I'm an economist by background and to this day I help crypto businesses, law firm and consulting firm navigate through this new regulatory uh, crypto asset regime that we have in Europe that we call MICA, which is for market in crypto asset. So I will do my best to not go too deep into technicalities because knowing myself I can get easily carried away with that. Uh, but instead I will give you, I will try to give you a context uh, what is the current timeline right now? What are the current challenges? And also, what are the most asked questions that we receive on a daily basis? But first, okay, what is happening in the world? So, for instance, in the financial uh, industry, we have a uh, European investment bank who issued their first green uh, digital bond. So it's not their first... Uh, digital bond itself. The first one was in April 2021, but it's the first uh, um, green one. Uh, next, we have a few weeks ago, um, Deutsche Bank who applied for a digital uh, as uh, asset license in Germany because they basically they plan to launch a digital asset custody platform that do many services and that is basically uh, for the users to buy and sell digital assets. Then we have something very interesting also in Hong Kong. So, uh, we have typically uh, the opposite situation than the, in the US. We have uh, Hong Kong regulators who are basically pressuring uh, banks such as uh, HSBC to actually work with crypto clients, which is something that we don't really see that, uh, often. We have also uh, UK who, uh, who, uh, who, get, who got a little bit tougher in terms of their regulation uh, in their marketing uh, strategy. So basically firms now can only market crypto assets uh, to UK customer if they have the appropriate knowledge and experience to do so. And they also introduced a new cooling off uh, system for new investors. Uh, next, we have something also very interesting coming from a, a global um, uh, standpoint uh, that's come from the uh, IOSCO, the International Organization of Security Commission. So basically, what does it mean? So it was, it's the first time uh, uh, ever that we see it in crypto that an international organization uh, provides some policy recommendations and consultations. Uh, through all uh, jurisdictions. So IOSCO is an organization that is basically the umbrella for the securities authorities, but they don't have the power to make any, the, they don't have the power to force any jurisdiction to do anything. But I think it's very important because it's the first, it's the first step uh, of this policy recommendation because they have more than 95% of the whole world that are members to it. So what are in those recommendations? It goes from a conflict of interest, uh, from custody, client asset protections, security, and so on. So the, the important part here is that since they don't have the power to impose anything, of course, each member, uh, this 130 members from this organization can choose not to do anything with it. But apparently, the, the, what I was told and what the, uh, in an interview the Jean-Paul Servet said, that they're quite confident that those jurisdictions will still uh, implement those, uh, those uh, recommendations worldwide. Uh, then we have, of course, the ACC and the, and the war against crypto in the US, which they claim that they already have, they claim that their clarity is already there for many years, which, of course, the crypto industry is totally against that, uh, that statement. One important fact, I think, is that right now, if you know, uh, BlackRock apply for a Bitcoin ETF to, through SEC, and which is interesting because BlackRock has a success rate of 575 um, uh, um, requests for authorization through SEC, and um, SEC has a 33 um, a refusal on, on, on those, uh, the, the six, I mean, not the success rate, but they refused 33 times those Bitcoin ATFs. So it will be very interesting to see how ACC will position itself with, with BlackRock, BlackRock, because I don't think, in my opinion, BlackRock would, would ask for this type of authorization if, uh, if they, they have no chance to, to be approved. So that, that one is, uh, we need to follow with that. We have also the Data Act uh, making a lot of noise as well, uh, because basically one of the one of the article, which is the Article 30, is mentioning uh, something that might go against actually the permissionless nature of smart contract. So right now they're actually discussing of how to change those things. So we'll see, I guess, in a few days what is the, the verdict on that. So we can see, of course, that there's a lot of things going on. 
Um, but before we go a bit deeper into it, how many of you understand the context of Mika? What is the scope of Mika? Please raise your hands, the one that, on, that knows that. One, two, three, five, few people. Um, so basically, in the traditional financial world, we have MIFID. MIFID is the, for the financial instrument. So this is for one specific type of instrument. With Mika, it's not covering the traditional one, but like I like to say, the non-traditional one, which is for crypto assets. And they have a lot of, uh, the scope is quite broad, so you have stablecoin, which is the asset reference token, and the e-money token, and also a lot of um, utility tokens that are included into it. And this part, the third one, is quite, is quite important because the first two are quite strict and we actually know uh, which type of token are those. But for the utility token, it will be a bit uh, tricky, I think, to ca categorize those things. So it's important to understand that um, crypto assets that are already defined under financial instrument um, as a definition on the MIFID and as e-money under uh, the e-money directive will not be, of course, under MICA. Um, and this directive, when it will come into application in uh, 12, 18 months, will replace natural, national jurisdiction. And whether MICA is applicable or not, it's not linked to the technology that is used. So this is very important. So it's not because a financial instrument used blockchain that it will be automatically a MICA instrument. Um, so you have, of course, financial instrument, but you also have some entities that are targeted. So for MIFID, you have, for instance, the banks. And for, for Mika, it will be any issuer of those stable coins and of those utility tokens, but also what we call in the industry uh, the crypto asset service providers, which are CASPs. You can have a little equivalent with MIFID. It could be a, a crypto exchange, a crypto fund, a crypto um, management uh, services as well. So you have nine categories uh, of those that are here, but I will not go too deep into this. But what is not under the scope? So we uh, mentioned uh, before, the, the panel before mentioned uh, NFTs. So yes, technically NFTs are not under, under the scope, except if they are released in a large series. So it's not because you call something an NFT that automatically it will not be under Mika. So this is very important. So if um, it's released in a large series, it will be considered as, as fungible, so therefore on the Mika. But again, what is large series? We don't know also. Uh, the second uh, point that is not on the Mika is uh, all the services that are provided in a fully decentralized manner. Once again here, we have a bit of a blurry line. What, what does it mean, fully decentralized? So this is also a hot topic of, of the moment. Uh, and also all the, um, all the services that are representing a physical uh, asset are not also under the scope. So it could be real estate, for instance. So you also have some, if you have a crypto asset that is already under one of the categories here, if it's a financial instrument, if it's a fund, if it's a deposit, if it's a securization, it's also not under the scope. But who is also not under the scope? Because we talked about the what, but who are not concerned about this regulation? This is basically the big authorities, such as International Monetary Fund, uh, the Bank of International Settlement, European Central Bank, etc., etc. But no, what is next? So like we mentioned before, tomorrow is the entry into force of Mika. So I'm sure this year you heard so much of Mika is finally signed, Mika is finally in the European Journal, but the big day actually is tomorrow because it will enter into force, leaving 12 or 18 months of time of implementation before the entry into application that you see here in June 2024 for stablecoin and December 2024 for utility tokens, so which are other types of crypto assets, and crypto asset service provider. So it means, so what does it mean? That in December 2021, if a crypto asset service provider wants to provide this service in Europe, they will need to have the Mika license. They will need to have this, this passport that will allow them to provide services through all Europe. And in the meantime, it will be the implementation phase. Uh, and during this implementation phase, uh, ESMA, with, uh, in collaboration with other authorities, will draft some regulatory standards that will be divided in three different packages. Uh, and the first one will be launched next month. And what are those packages? Basically, quickly, during those consultation packages uh, consultation, 
uh, you will have uh, some uh, theme that will be discussed. So we will have more clarity uh, in terms of the implementation. So for instance, in July, uh, they're going to release uh, the form and the template for CASP, uh, for CASP to, um, to ask for the authorizations. Next, uh, in October, you, it will be more about sustainability uh, indicators. And in 2024, it will be about investor protection. What are the potential impacts? So here the impacts are of course various, but one of the main ones for the crypto players are of course the additional costs. Although I do believe that the costs will be, um, will be propor proportional of the size of the company. So the bigger the company, the bigger the cost for compliance. You, have, you might see also some specialization across Europe, uh, which means that, for instance, you will have some national uh, competence authority that will, will go more into one type of services. For instance, Luxembourg can be specialized more in the crypto fund, uh, whereas uh, Malta will be more into e-gaming. Uh, then we might have, we might see also a boost in the crypto uh, industry in general, uh, in the, within the financial industry, because of Mika nature. A lot of it, um, the authorized um, credit institution might not need to have the license itself. They will need to comply, of course, to some requirements, but they will not need to have the license, which means that any banks from uh, from the entry into application will be allowed to offer crypto services. And of course, one thing to pay attention is the interaction with between other legislation, like uh, such as the TFR, Data Act, like I mentioned, DLT pilot regime, etc. So, but what if the service provider is not based in European Union? So I mentioned that this license is mandatory for any crypto service that wants to target European Union. So that means that if you are a US company, you want to sell your service in Europe, unless it's the person who came to you on their own initiative, you will need to have the license. And this way of doing, basically, it's called on the reverse solicitation basis. So if a European clients come to the US crypto fund and say, OK, I come to you, you didn't target me, you didn't market uh, to my country, then it's fine. So of course, some of you have some red flags. So if the US crypto fund wants to, um, if they, they start to make some ads uh, in Belgium, for instance, or in France, if they put the website in a specific European language, all those things can be a really red flag for regulators when they will control that. Um, so is it worth for a company to start getting ready today? So this is another question I receive. I, of course, I would say yes, the better, uh, the sooner the better. But if I need to quote Janet Ho, which, who, who is the head of policy for Europe at Chain Analysis, she's also saying the same thing. For the, re the only reason that it might take up to five months to receive this license. Why five months? Because of the procedure that it might take in terms of working days. So for instance, to, uh, the authority have 25 working days to uh, ask any additional information. And then they have 60 days to grant uh, or refuse the, um, the, the application, which is basically 17 weeks. So in the best case scenario, it might take five months, in the best case scenario. So should a, a CAST apply for a national license? Because like I say, Mika is entering into application within 12 and 18 months. So what is happening in between? So I would say that the advantage of a national license is that you can operate within this national regime in that country. So that gives you this uh, freedom uh, to operate there. However, this is my brainstorm with some friends lawyers as well in Europe. We might say also that if you have a license in let's say in France, and you go to a country that doesn't have any national regime, you might actually get away with that because you go to a country, you target a country that doesn't have a national license yet, so the one before Mika, so it could be fine until Mika come into force. However, if you are from a national um, country, if you are from a country without a national license and you want to provide your services in France, where there is, of course, a, a, a national licensing regime already before Mika into place, of course, you will not be able to do it. And also, as a VASP, uh, if you have a, a national license that we so far call VASP uh, before Mika, you also will have this 18 months uh, transitional period after the entry into application. So that means that in December 2024, you will have this grace period of 18 months that you still can operate uh, with that national license without having uh, the obligation to, to have this, uh, this Mika license, basically. So what jurisdiction to choose? This is the one million uh, uh, euro questions, I would say, but 
I, I will disappoint you. There is no general answer uh, to it. It depends. It depends a lot of, on a lot of things. So it can depend on your business model, uh, on your initial market uh, base, uh, where is your for, uh, workforce uh, located, your future goals, etc., etc. So each cases are different from uh, one one case uh, to, to another, basically. So what are, to conclude, what are the, the challenges here? So the challenges here is, of course, regulatory arbitrage, because we know that in the regulatory world, it's very hard to achieve harmonization. So arbitrage and fragmentation is, very, is, is a part of it in the U European uh, level and also worldwide. Also, we struggle a bit with definition. Like I mentioned, for instance, what is a fully decentralized mean? What, uh, what is taking? All those little terms that we hopefully we are working on to get some clarity on those. Also, the importance of classifications, meaning that what if um, a crypto asset service provider provides at the same time financial instruments, but also crypto? Is it under MiCA? Is it under MIFID? So all those questions need to be addressed. And also, one huge challenge, I would say, is the fast-moving industry. For instance, if you know a bit the NFT space, you know that you can actually create ERC-7021 that are nested, which can be actually an uh, index fund, for instance. So it can be used as a financial instrument. But it's technically not on the Mika. So you have all those questions that are like here. And to conclude, uh, I would say that I mean, for me, one of the biggest challenge actually is communication between regulators, authorities, and the industry. Because it's, that it's, it's while communicating that we actually don't stop innovation, we stop bad players, and we let the people do the things, we let them evolve with them, uh, we, we actually promote innovation. And at the same time, we, uh, we stop bad players. So I think the communication needs to be uh, needs to be pair and pair with uh, with the industry, and with that we can we can move on uh, safely. So I think as you, I'm very curious to be also in this space, and um, I'm curious to see what's going to happen this year. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elisa.